remember that we have the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So remember when you're looking at when you're looking at this model, it's very similar to this picture, and that we have the renal cord muscle, and we have the afferent arterial leading into the capillary vein, efferent arterial draining it. And then the, a loop of the distal convoluted tubule comes back and is associated with either the afferent, efferent, or both. And so the cells that are specialized in the distal convoluted tubule are these cells, which are the macula densa. And then there are cells in the wall of the artery and kind of sandwiched between the two arteries that are juxtaglomerular cells. And then these two groups of cells, so the cells here, juxtaglomerular cells, the cells here, the macula densa, form the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Okay? And so what that provides is a way in which the filtrate, which is passing through the distal convoluted tubule, as it changes with GFR net filtration pressure, then those changes are picked up, picked up by the macula densa cells, and they communicate with the juxtaglomerular cells. So you have this, this JGA, juxtaglomerular apparatus. And so in our distal convoluted tubule, we have these specialized group of cells right here, which is the macula. And then we have the arteries, so the afferent and efferent arteries. And we have those specialized cells that are uh, sandwiched between, which are our, our JG cells. Okay. So what's going to happen is as, as changes in so as changes in this filtrate occur, then as it's picked up by this juxtaglomerular apparatus, what actually happens is these cells release a compound to the blood, uh, and then that compound that's released is renin. So the only only similarity of this renin to the renin we use in the last unit in the digestive lab is they're, they're both proteins, but they're not related to one another even though they sound similar. Okay. So what actually happens is the liver itself constantly makes a, makes a protein that's put into the blood. So the protein put into the blood is this angiostensinogen. So, yeah, this. And so what do we remember about this thing here? It's an inactive form of some protein. So the liver is constantly making this angiostin synergy. And by the way, it's one of those large proteins that we don't want the uh, filter to remove from the blood and allow it to go out into the filter. So it's one of those proteins that we retain uh, because of our filtration uh, process that's occurring in the blood. So, so what actually happens is that when renin interacts with angiostensinogen, it actually converts it to, to angiotensin. One. Okay. So it's going to convert this compound to angiotensin 1. And then what happens is angiotensin 1 travels to the lungs where we have a, another compound that's produced by capillary beds within the capillary beds of the lung. And so it's called angiostensin converting enzyme. So, so ACE, A-C-E, is in the lungs, uh, in the capillary beds of the lungs. And then what actually happens is, is 
is angiot angiotensin converting enzyme ACE is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Okay. And then angiotensin 2 is then going to go several places. So the angiotensin 2 goes back to the kidney where it can help control GFR. It goes to the adrenal gland. Where it's going to cause the release of a hormone. And it goes to the hypothalamus, where it causes the release of a hormone. Okay, so. So this is a mechanism by which the kidney itself initiates the release of hormones from other endocrine organs to help regulate kidney function. Okay. So again, as we get changes in the filtrate, it triggers uh, the juxtaposal marrow cells to release renin. Renin works on a, uh, a protein that's produced by the liver at a reasonably constant rate. And it's one of the large proteins that we don't want to let pass through the filter. So angiostensinogen. Renin converts angiostensinogen to angiostensin 1. And then angiostensin 1 circulates in the blood to the lungs, where ACE is produced by, by capillary beds in the lungs and converts it to angiostensin 2. Then the angiostensin 2 is circulated by the blood back to the kidney, where it can help control GFR to the adrenal gland where it causes the release of a hormone that we're going to talk about here in a minute, and to the hypothalamus where it causes the release of a hormone that we're going to talk about in a minute. And then both those hormones then are going to go back and affect kidney function. So then both of these hormones start with, with this slide, then we're actually going to look at two hormones, uh, and they're antagonistic hormones. So they're going to have opposite effects on the kidney. Uh, the angiostensin 2 that we have diagrammed up there, and then a different one, which is atrial naturate peptide, which comes from the two upper chambers of the heart, the atrium. So this is a control mechanism from the heart. Right. So, so if we have, for some reason, a decrease in blood volume, and if we have a decrease in blood volume, we'll also get a decrease in blood pressure. Right. Then uh, uh, let's just say that somebody's hemorrhaging, somebody's dehydrated for some event, but for some reason, blood, blood volume's dropping. So initially, if blood volume drops, what would happen to GFR? it would drop too, right? Because if blood volume is going down and blood pressure is going down, then GBHB would be going down. And if GBHB goes down, then initially GFR would go down, right? So the initial event is that we've got this, this drop in blood pressure uh, that's causing a decrease in GFR. Now, ideally, the kidney would like to do what? To try to equalize GFR and bring it back to normal. Because the kidney's role in homeostasis is to roughly do 125 mLs of filtrate per minute, right? And then what we talked about was the trade-off in, 
and events that are exacerbating. So if we continue to get a drop in blood pressure, then eventually the kidney can't continue to process blood because you've got to maintain poor circulation. Right? Okay. So in this, in this instance, because we're dehydrated uh, and we've got this drop in blood pressure, then what we're going to do is constrict both the afferent and efferent arterial to try to decrease GFR even further so that we aren't processing urine and moving fluid out into, out into uh, the filtration process and compromising poor circulation. So what we do is GFR, drop GFR until we can bring blood pressure back up and bring blood volume back up. Does that make sense? So you would want to make more pee and lose more water and urine if you've got a if you've got a decrement in blood volume because you got to maintain core circulation. Does that make sense? So what actually happens, which is kind of interesting, is angiotensin two levels as they go up decrease kidney function and cause you to retain water. So the newest blood pressure medicines are called ACE inhibitors. And so they inhibit this process of ACE converting angiostensin into one to angiostensin two, so that if somebody has high blood volume and high blood pressure, if you block the, for the formation of ACE in the capillary bed, then you block the formation of angiotensin II, and you block the release of these two hormones, plus decrease, uh, plus don't decrease GFR, then you pee more, and blood volume drops, and blood pressure drops. So that's what the new ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, and the other blood pressure medicines are actually doing. They're playing with this little event and they're blocking the formation of ACE, so we don't form angiostensin two. So we don't. So what we need to put over here is it controls a decrease in GFR, which would make you retain more water. And if that you naturally retain more water, then blood volume goes up and blood pressure goes up. So we, it's it's just a clever trick. And, take a compound that blocks this, you don't get this, and then GFR goes up. So if GFR goes up, you pee more. And if you pee more, blood volume goes down, and blood pressure goes down. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <coughs> now let's look at the other one. So the other one is actually the heart itself. And so we're going to do the heart in the next unit. But the thinnest walls in the heart are in the upper two chambers here, which are the atria. And so since they are the thinnest walls in the heart, then they are uh, more problematic to be overstretched. And so what we actually have is we have cells that are in the atria of the heart that respond to the stretching of, of the heart itself. And so if we get an increase in, in blood volume, then we get an increase in blood pressure. And then what's going to happen is we're going to get an increase in the force on the walls of the atrium. So the heart itself then is going to direct the kidney to increase GFR to decrease blood volume to take the stretch back out of the overstretching of the heart back out. And then what happens if you, you have chronic high blood pressure for a long period of time is that the walls of the heart become thicker but less pliable. So what happens is you get an enlargement of the heart with chronic high blood pressure. And it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing because the heart doesn't pump as well when it's enlarged. So so what what we're trying to do is prevent that from happening. Okay. So then what happens is the heart releases this compound 
uh, called AMP, atrial natriuretic peptide. And then what that's going to do is go to the kidney. And then the role in the kidney is to increase GFR. So if you increase GFR, you're going to increase filtration. You'd pee more. And if you're peeing more, then you would lose blood volume. And blood pressure would go down, and the stretching of the heart would go down. So, because it, so we, we have an axis, so this is inverse of this one, where this is a decrease in blood volume, this is an increase in blood volume, leading to increase in blood pressure. So, there are specialized cells in the kidney that uh, AMP target. They're these mesagnal cells, which are uh, other cells that we haven't talked about yet that are involved in the filtration of surface. And what we're going to do is increase GFR. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go back to this picture. Actually, this picture doesn't have it. So I'm going to go back to one we looked at. Let's go to this picture. So here's our renal corpuscle again with our glomerulus, our afferent arterial, our efferent arterial, just glomerular apparatus here. So in the fold, Within the glomerulus are these aggregates of cells that fill in these spaces. Okay. So, so the way this actually works is that you've actually got these capillary beds and you've got these cells that are covering them. And the cells can increase in size or decrease in size. And where the where the cell is covering the filter, you can't you can't do any filtration. Okay. So you you can't filter in the area where these mesangial cells are covering the filter. Right? And so what A and B actually does is it causes these cells to decrease in size. So what A and B does is is decrease surface coverage by these cells. So if you decrease the size of the cell, you increase the total filter surface. And if you increase the total filter surface, you can increase net filtration or increase GFR uh, indirectly. All right. So what actually happens is these cells actually can get bigger, cover more of this surface, or they can shrink down and cover less of the surface. And AMP causes them to shrink down and decrease their surface coverage which increases uh, uh, filtration surface area. And if we can increase filtration surface area, we can increase GFR. If we increase GFR, the amount of urine the individual is going to produce would go up or down. Uh, and so the net effect is you'd lose more water through urination. So blood volume would drop, <coughs> blood pressure would drop. Okay, so two different mechanisms to control the GFR. So we can think of angiotensin II as the as a critical hormone to a dehydration event or a significant drop in blood volume. And the goal is to try to maintain blood volume by decreasing the amount of water being lost in the urine. So would that concentrate your urine or or dilute your urine? So angiotensin Institute would concentrate our So tying that to Thirsty's lab, if we were doing if we were doing a dipstick on this patient, <coughs> would a specific volume increase toward 1.03 or decrease toward 1.003? Volume of 
the year of the rain. That's what we said. And then when we we're measuring specific gravity, we're looking at solutes over water. So if we decrease the volume of uh, urine, we would decrease this. We haven't talked about doing anything with this yet. So if the total solutes go up, then specific gravity goes up. Correct? Yes. Yay! The volume. Then the urine would be more concentrated. All right. Perfect. So if we have atrial anterior peptide, then it's because we have an increase in blood volume, an increase in blood pressure, overstretching our heart. So we're going to release AMP. It's going to affect those lysagonal cells, cause them to shrivel up, increase surface area of the filter, which is right GFR up. So in this instance, are we going to P more or P less? So how much, what's going to happen to urine volume? So we're going to increase volume of urine. So if we increase volume of urine, what's going to happen with specific gravity? It's going to go down because now we have dilute urine. So if we were looking at it in a urine cup, if somebody has high blood pressure, high blood volume, lots of AMP being released, producing lots of urine, then their urine would be very, very light yellow or very, very dark yellow. Very light yellow. Conversely, this person over here who's concentrating their urine and their specific gravity is going up, their urine would be darker. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, ADH is the hormone that's released by the hypothalamus. So typically what happens in your body is, is you get an increase in uh, circulating level of angiosins 2. It affects the hypothalamus, and it would drive the, the amount of circulating ADH in your body up. And so ADH is the acronym for anti-diuretic hormone. <coughs> so let's just work with the word diuretic for a second. So the word diuretic comes from diuresis, which means to increase urine production. Okay. So if somebody is diuresing, they would be producing large volumes of dilute urine, and their specific gravity of their urine would go down. All right. So that's what a diuretic does. So the one we would use clinically is a compound called Lasix. And when you give somebody Lasix, they just pee like crazy. And they produce large volumes of dilute urine. So why would we give somebody a diuretic like Lasix? Typically is because they're, they're in kidney failure. The kidney is not producing urine, so their blood volume is going way up, their blood pressure is going way up. And usually they would have significant edema in their extremities. And you use Lasix to drive water out of the body to manage the edema events that, that are going on. So you would see it particularly in people in, in, in hospitals that are, that are compromised. So if you don't want to, di to diurese, then you would want a anti-diuretic. <laughs> an anti-diuretic would make you pee less, and your specific gravity of urine would go up, and your urine would become much more concentrated. So it cycles with angiotensin II in, in, in hemorrhaging events and in dehydration events where blood volume is dropping, blood pressure is dropping, and the kidney's role is to try to maintain uh, water balance in your body by decreasing the amount of water you're using, losing, excuse me, during urination. Okay. 
So what we would do is we would see 88 cycle with a distance of two, and also if you get a decrease in blood volume, a decrease in extracellular fluid volume, which would be interstitial fluid plus plasma. Uh, and then what ADH does is it targets cells that are in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, <laughs> and they're called principal cells. And so principal cells are in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. And what happens is there is a gene that we have that inserts a protein in membranes, and if the protein uh, molecule is in membranes, it acts as a, a channel through which water can move more quickly through the membrane itself. Okay. So remember, water molecules are fairly small, but we still have uh, a membrane made up of phospholipids, so that we end up with this nonpolar area of the membrane. And this nonpolar area of the membrane then affects the ability of water to move through it. Although water can move through it, it limits the capacity to move water. So the way to think about it in osmosis, to really move water quickly, you have to significantly increase the concentration to drive the water through the membrane, uh, which is problematic sometimes for us to try to, to create a concentration that is significant. So what we do is we insert this little protein is called aquaporin 2, so kind of cool, aqua water pour. So it's essentially translates to water pour. And then water molecules can move much more quickly to the membrane. So what aquaporin does is facilitate a more rapid osmotic event. Okay. But because it's an osmotic event, then water is always still going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So you can create this water pour and still have the water move in the direction that your body wants it to move. Does that make sense? Because you're still you're still dealing with a concentration gradient of water to create that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so what actually happens then is this would be the lumen side of the DCT or collecting duct. And then this would be the side where we have our peritubular capillaries. So what you're trying to do is model water out of lumen that would be urine and return it to your blood. And as we return water to our blood, we're going to do what to blood volume, increase blood volume and then ultimately try to increase blood pressure to maintain water balance, all right? So this is a cool hormone that we can use to turn on a gene to put these pores in, and they're, they're unique to the principal cells because principal cells have the receptors for, for the hormone. And so that's why it doesn't work on other cells is because there are no receptors. So a unique receptor for ADH. And because the cells have ADH receptors, then it targets those cells. They produce this aquaporin, and we move water to the water. So our goal is to try to increase blood volume in an event where we've had a decrease in blood volume, so that eventually we can go back to doing our normal GFR after our blood volume and blood pressure have returned to normal, right? All right. Now, the other hormone is aldosterone that circulates with angiostin 2, but that's our hormone of our adrenal gland. So aldosterone is our hormone that we're talking about here with the adrenal gland. All right. And then what aldosterone is going to do is it's going to target the same cells, the principal cells. But what it's going to do is alter the reabsorption of sodium. So what we have in our filter, uh, what we have in our lumen also, uh, our sodium ions mixed in. So 
we can move slowly, sodium slowly through a membrane. But if we want to move sodium rapidly through a membrane, we have to move it by active transport. And so what aldosterone is going to do is, is increase an active transport mechanism, increase the activity of an active transport mechanism. So what we're going to do then is we're going to move sodium out of the lumen into our cells ultimately, and then eventually into the blood. And because we have to stay electrically balanced, or else we screw up our ability to, to conduct nerve impulses, to conduct cardiac muscle contraction, to conduct skeletal muscle contraction. And if we're going to take up a, a uh, plus charged ion, then we either have to take up a negative ion to maintain charge balance, or expel a other positive ion. And so what we actually do is we convert, we trade potassium for, so we trade potassium for sodium. And so what we're going to do for every sodium we take up, we're going to get rid of a potassium. So what kind of transport mechanism is this? Is this a symporter, antiporter? So symporter, same direction, antiporter, opposite directions. So it's an antiporter. <laughs> so what aldosterone does is trigger an increased activity of a common antiporter that we have throughout our body that we've talked about, a sodium potassium pump. And so what we would do then is if we were actually measuring urine at the end, we would see a decrease in sodium content in the person's urine, but we'd see an increase in potassium content in the person's urine. And those are things that you can actually test for in urine, although the dipstick doesn't test for it. Those are the, I used to do that, but those are the things where you have to heat the urine. And then students were always dropping urine on the hot plates, and then the whole lab's done like really hot urine. So, so I just quit doing it because I got tired of the smell of burning urine. <laughs> so when it came to membrane potential, it was the 3 to 2 ratio for sodium potassium. Uh -huh. Is it the same for this? No. OK. Now, this is a little different mechanism. This is the one one mechanism. Okay. So it's not exactly the same sort of potassium pump. Right? But then our goal, so make sense out of this. So, so these two work together. Okay. So as we're putting water through, then the concentration gradient is eventually going to change, right? because we're diluting our solutes inside of our cell. So by bringing sodium in, we can try to maintain a concentrated gradient to help draw more, draw more water. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, text of glomerular apparatus. And so here's uh, here's kind of a flow chart like I put up here. We can just add detail. Uh, so we use the word perfusion to indicate uh, blood flow into uh, tissue. So if we increase perfusion, we get an increase in blood flow. If we decrease perfusion, you get a decrease in blood flow. Okay. So if we get a decrease in renal perfusion, it's because we got to drop in blood pressure, which could be due to a drop in blood volume, right? So we're in a state of dehydration, or we're hemorrhaging, for some reason blood volume is dropping. So as that happens, then we get a decrease in the rate of filtration flow over the juxtaglomerular apparatus, because as renal perfusion drops, GFR initially drops, right? And so we get a decrease in the relative amount of filtrate in our distal convoluted tubule. And we could also get a change in the relative constitution of solutes as well. So that triggers the juxtaposition cells to release renin. So the juxtaposition cells release renin. 
Renin interacts with this pre-made protein, angiotensinogen, which is made by what organ? Liver. The liver. And so if we have renin released by the juxtaparameter cells, converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then where does it go to encounter ACE? The lungs. The lungs. Okay. And so then uh, in the lungs, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor, which is what we talked about in the afferent and efferent arterial. So ultimately, by vasoconstricting, we would do what to GFR? Decrease it or increase it? Decrease. We would decrease it because we're trying to bring blood volume up because we want to pee less, right? So then, this also causes a relief of aldosterone. So what organ, what organ is that? The adrenal gland. The adrenal gland. And then aldosterone does what in the kidney? You can just put an arrow over here. I didn't throw this in all the way for you. Uh, and so what cells does aldosterone hit, target? Principal cells. In the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And then what does that cause principal cells to do? Increase their reabsorption of sodium. So we could also have another arrow from angiotensin 2 down here, and we could put a block with ADH, so if we fill it in like I did on the board. And then what, what organ would produce ADH? The part of the brain, the hypothalamus. Right? And then ADH is going to target what cells? Principal cells. And they're in what two areas of a nephron? distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And what do they cause principal cells to do? Produce a membrane-bound protein called aquaporin uh, that enhances the rate of osmosis and would make you pee less or pee more? Pee less. Uh, because you're reabsorbing more water, which helps you bring blood volume back up, which helps us from recover what's going on with our body, right? So then, it, would your specific gravity of your urine go up or down if ADA slows? Up. Then if you use lysenopril, which is a inhibitor, then we block the formation of and just instant two. So we decrease the release of aldosterone. We decrease the release of ADH. And you would pee more, which would drop your blood volume, which drops your blood pressure. So that's why we can use it as a, a blood pressure medicine. <coughs> With many, many less side effects. Yeah. Individual right. or Yes. So the blockers are designed to um, impact fewer, have a, a smaller impact on your body. Because you're still producing angiotensin 2. So you still get, you can still get some vasoconstriction in the areas you want it. But you, but so the receptors are on the adrenal gland and hypothalamus. And so you're decreasing the production of aldosterone, ADH. And, but it's not, uh, some people, uh, the receptor blocker isn't as effective as the ACE inhibitor. So it doesn't look at this point like we can take everybody off the inhibitor and just put them on the, the, the receptor blocker. Because I, I, there's apparently, my, my guess is that there's a little variation of receptors. So some people's receptors respond more closely to this blocker. So the way a blocker works is in this membrane, you've got this, this protein that we call a receptor. And so then what has to happen is, uh, is that uh, A2 has to bind with that receptor. 
and then that facilitates the bleed's reaction. Well, because it's a protein embedded in the membrane, then we can also have subtle differences in the protein if we've had some uh, mutations over time in the three-letter code. So some receptors aren't as effective as other receptors, and we know that is true for for testosterone, and know it's true for estrogen. So it would make sense as well as true for this too. So what you have to do is kind of play, with, play a game. If you want to take someone off of uh, an ACE inhibitor, then you got to see if it controls their blood pressure as well with the receptor blocker. And some people it doesn't. Then you put them back on the ACE inhibitor. <laughs> but the idea was to have a less full body effect more targeted uh, uh, pharmaceutical. All right. So these are just kind of ways to, just like a flow chart to, to rethink things. So, so we start the process in homeostasis with normal GFR. And so what's going to disrupt our homeostasis is a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys. So why would we get a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys? Because you got a decrease in blood volume and decrease in blood pressure going on. We could also have a blockage of the renal artery for some reason, which we would see in, in patients with, with high blood cholesterol, uh, maybe with inter, intervascular clotting of blood. There be, could be several other reasons why it would happen. Okay. So if we get a decrease in blood flow to the kidney, then we're going to get a decrease in GFR initially, right? So since we're going to get a decrease in GFR, we get a decrease in filtration pressure, and we'll get a decrease in filtrate, and urine production would initially go down. So the body wants to try to respond to try to maintain GFR if possible, because that's the way we get rid of urea, which is a waste product from the use of proteins and, and amino acids and nitrogen kills you. In fact, if your kidney just stops working, period, uh, 14 days later, you're dead from, from nitrogen toxicity. So, so that's why we have to actually use, uh, you, use uh, uh, artificial filter dialysis to try to keep someone alive if their kidney stops working. And unfortunately, we haven't figured out dialysis machine that could be used for decades by someone without long-term consequences. It really depends on the extent of their kidney function. If their kidney completely fails, particularly if you're dealing with older people, they slowly continue to degrade even though you're doing dialysis. And eventually, most of the families I've known that dealt with it, the person just decides to simply just go through the process because it's so painful all the time. So, so what we're going to do is we've got a decrease in filtrate at our distal convoluted tubule is the juxtaplomerular cells are going to release renin. And, and renin is going to cause the formation of angiosensin 1, which is going to circulate to blood organ the lungs where ACE converts it to angiosensin 2. So that little block has some detail behind it as well. Right? So then one of the places that A2 is going to be active is in the adrenal gland. And just to make sure we're, we're dealing with that, the adrenal gland is kind of a triangular shaped gland that sits on top of the kidney. And we can divide it into a center component called the glandula and in a, a surface component called the core plant. It's actually the surface tissue that produces, uh, that actually produces aldosterone. So it's a cortex, the adrenal cortex. Then what we know is aldosterone increases sodium retention because it targets what cells? Principal cells. And the distal convoluted and collecting that. Uh, and then what that's going to help us do is increase our osmotic potential to draw water. Uh, so it's going to help us return blood volume. 
So the other two thing A2 does is it also uh, increases the stimulation of thirst centers, which makes us consume more water, which helps us bring water volume down. And that's one of the side effects of being on an ACE inhibitor, is people don't want to drink. Um, so when you have people on an ACE inhibitor, you have to keep working with them that they need to be drinking at least two liters of water a day. You know, you have these two bottles, and every day, because you know, they don't want to drink. Because it deep, their, their, their brain isn't telling them to drink normally. Uh, and so they tend to want to dehydrate themselves if you aren't careful with them. All right, and then A2 also goes to what? Organ that's going to produce ADH? The uh, hypothalamus. And then there's quite a bit with this arrow, right? Because ADH affects what cells? The principal cells. And the distal convoluted to and the collective dots, right? So it causes an increase in osmosis. So because we're gonna increase osmotic pressure, uh, then we're gonna increase fluid retention, increase blood volume, and what's gonna to happen to urine output? Urine output's going to decrease, and urine concentration is going to Increase. So we're going to see an increase in, in specific gravity of urine if we were actually testing it with the dipstick, right? All right, and then the other part we haven't talked about, or, or we did talk about that's putting this together, is we also have a sympathetic response, right? Uh, which is a sympathetic response so that we can, uh, we can constrict venous root reserves so we move more blood from our skin to core circulation to help temporarily try to resolve this. So if somebody's done that and we were actually taking their pulse or trying to figure out how they're feeling, well, how would their hands feel? Cool. Yeah, their hands will start getting cool and climbing in because we're actually vasoconstricting to the surface to try to increase blood volume temporarily. Right? So we haven't talked about this part, it's, it's in the next unit, but when we look at cardiac output, and cardiac output is two events, so stroke volume. So this is the relative volume of blood that we've been dealing with, times heart rate. So, if stroke volume is going down, what we want to, if we want to try to maintain cardiac output, then we would elevate heart rate. And that's what the body would normally do, is elevate heart rate to try to, to do that. So what the sympathetic nervous system would do to increase cardiac output in an event where we've got stroke volume down would be to increase heart rate. So not only would this patient's hands be cold, but their pulse would be high. They'd have a rapid pulse during this event, trying to maintain cardiac output. So we get an increase in cardiac output by increasing heart rate. <coughs> okay, so one of the cool things about the kidney is the loop of Henle. And the loop of Henle is designed to allow the kidney to make an exchange uh, for key electrolytes that we want with other solids. So to try to make sense out of the loop of Henle, then remember in cortical nephrons, the loop of Henle is really short. And in juxtamandulary nephrons, the loop of Henle is quite long, okay? And then we would find the loop of Henle in a pyramid in the kidney. So where we find all our loop of Henry's are in the renal pyramids, okay? So the second thing to remember that we've talked about is that the descending limb of Henle 
is lying by what cells? So there's simple squamous cell. And then as we get to the thick acid, then we convert it to simple cuboid cells, right? So in essence, what's going on is we've got a much longer thin descending limb of Emily and a longer thick ascending limb of Emily in a adjusted basilar nephron. So we essentially have more surface area to do stuff. Okay. Right. So that's the key to the squamous over here and then the columnar here. So the thick parts of the loop of Emily are impermeable to water. So they're impermeable to water. So in this area, water cannot move. So we can't take water and move it back out of our loops. This is stopped in the, in the thick ascending limb of the limb. So we can't do any water movement in that thickest. But squamous cells are the cell of choice for osmosis. Okay. So in the thin limb of Italy, we can quickly move water. Okay. So we're actually moving water out of the lumen back out into these spaces. So we're moving water from the urine. So it's from the lumen down here. Okay. So in the thin part, it's permeable to water, but impermeable to solvents. Okay. So water can freely move, but what can't move are solutes like sodium and other solutes. So sodium and other solutes can't move, water can move. Here, water can't move, but we actively transport. So water is impermeable. So here, water is impermeable. We have active transport of solids. So what's the beauty of active of using active transport in this body? Because it does two things, right? It uncouples you from concentration gradients, and it becomes controllable. So you can control the movement of solutes. All right. Now the only solute that kind of is counterintuitive to this process is that in the bottom of our loops of Henley, then urea is actually an inner. And we actually use urea in our pyramids to create a concentration gradient. And so we can actually move urea by simple diffusion. Okay. So it's counter current because the fluid is traveling down toward the, the renal pyramid and the descending and then traveling back up in the ascending. So it's counter current because the fluid is traveling both directions through a concentration gradient. It's a multiplier because it allows us to add urea to our urine and then exchange the urea for other solutes. So in essence, what we're going to do is we're going to add urea here but save other solutes here, like sodium, potassium, calcium, some solutes that we want. So it's a counter current multiplier because it runs two directions. It multiplies urea and allows us to exchange other solutes for the urea. So it's, it's kind of a cool system uh, to do it. All right. <coughs> <coughs>
So the other thing to remember is that what we have is we have a concentration gradient. <laughs> and so we have about 300 milliosmoles at the interface of the cortex of the kidney. And then as we drop down toward the medulla, we can elevate it to about 1,200 milliosmoles. So remember, in milliosmoles, it's the number of solutes per unit of solution. And the larger the number, the higher the osmotic pull of water. Okay. So because water freely moves over here, then we're going to start with the urine inside of our lumen here at 300 milliosmol. And by the time we get to the bottom of a juxtapantillary nephron, the urine inside is going to be 1,200 milliosmol. So we have highly concentrated water here. But with, so this picture, and the picture they always show in textbooks, is actually of a juxtamedullary nephron. Because this one's never going to concentrate urine that much, because the loop of Hitler doesn't drop that as far down into the pyramid. So this one might be in the 900, 800 or so. So we're looking at really at Jackson Major Learning in this scenario. All right, so, so what we've talked about is if you use transporter mechanisms, then this would be the tubular fluid, so this is the movement. And so what we're going to do is we're going to expend energy to help us collect uh, critical ions that we need to keep ourselves balanced like sodium, like potassium, like calcium. And on this side, we actually have some symporter mechanisms. They're bringing both. But on this side, this is our classic antiporter, where we're moving sodium and potassium in opposite directions, trying to equilibrate charges in our, in our, in our And by expending energy for active transport, we can control the range. So then what you have to think about in relationship to the process is intertwined all over this loop of Henley is a capillary bed as well, right? So the ones unique to the juxtapantillary nephrons are vasorecta, right? So what we end up with is we end up with this vasorecta here, which is our capillary bed uh, that's intertwining our loop with him. And so the exchange we're actually going to make is we're going to, we're going to try to exchange with the lumen and then the current this vasorect. So our goal is to take water out of our loop of Henley and put it into our blood in the vasorect. Our goal is to take urea and move urea out of our blood and out of our interstitial places into the lumen. So we're going to concentrate urea. And on this side, we're going to move water. In the bottom, we're going to move water out but allow urea to enter. And now, when we get up here, then we shut off the movement of water. It's impermeable water. We don't allow urea to pass back out, but we exchange other solutes so that we can exchange sodium chloride and other things for urea. So what it allows us to do is concentrate our urine with urea. And we actually use urea, uh, move, we move the urea into the lumen, we can actually move it out of the lumen of our collecting duct because we want to maintain this concentration <coughs> in, our, in, in our pyramid. And we use urea as one of our major concentration so in your body, the highest place we'd ever find urea is in those pyramids where it's maintained. Okay. So it allows us to recycle salts, concentrate urea, and conserve water. Beauty of the junk current system. All right. So what we said was the proximal convoluted tubule was the major reabsorber in our nephron, right? So the easiest way to reabsorb something is diffusion. 
but diffusion is limited to how large a molecule is, how charged a molecule is, and concentration gradients. So there are some things that we can use simple diffusion for. If we want to untie ourselves from simple diffusion, then we we'll always have to use active transport. So within the proximal convoluted field, we use osmosis uh, as a way to reabsorb water. So we're always maintaining a higher concentration of water inside the lumen initially than in the peritubular capillaries. And so if you can create a concentration gradient, then water is always going to freely move. And that is obligatory in water reabsorption. Anywhere where simple diffusion is the mechanism. Because water is obligated to move. It's always going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So anywhere in the kidney where we naturally maintain this concentration gradient, the water has to move. Okay. And we actually reabsorb most of our water in the proximal convoluted tube. So we reabsorb 100% of all of our glucose, our other sugars like fructose, uh, all of our amino acids, and some vitamins. So if we're moving 100%, are we doing it by simple diffusion or active transport? Yeah, so it's by active transport. We're going to move it by active transport. We're actually going to move 60 to 70% of our sodium and chloride along with other important ions like calcium, magnesium phosphate and bicarbonate. And we can do that by simple diffusion, but it would be very time consuming, so we can do that with active transport as well. So when you look, we've got a lot of transporter mechanisms for those ions uh, that are actually occurring as well. All right, so we reabsorb a whole bunch of stuff. We do secrete some things like hydrogen ions. So if our blood is a city, then we want to get rid of hydrogen ions out of our blood. And so we what we want to do is put them in our urine. So if somebody's blood is a city, then when we did a dipstick, uh, what would happen to what would the what would the relative measure uh, in the urine be? Would the urine be, be more acidic or more basic? More acidic. So the one thing we can learn from a dipstick from urine pH is that if the person's urine is reasonably acidic, and indirectly we know that they've got an acid load in their blood. So it could be that they just have exercised really hard, and in that process, muscle became anaerobic, and if muscle becomes anaerobic, it makes lactic acid, and, and then put it in our blood, and then we gotta get rid of the lactic acid to try to maintain blood pH. All right, so, so we would move hydrogen ions to do that. And we do some ammonia, although we don't do near as much ammonia as cats and dogs do, which is why when you smell our urine, it burns your nose know, and eyes, because there's a much higher in ammonia than ours than human urine typically is. And then we get rid of creatinine, so we use we use creatinine clearance as a way to look at kidney function. And then the reason why we can do drug screens for Using using blood, we also get rid of warm drugs and toxins. So a lot of hormones and other things are secreted. So then, with our loop of Henle, then because we're doing osmosis on this side of water, and we're passing it down through a concentration gradient, and ultimately concentrating our urine at the bottom, then we can we can recover 25 percent more of our water. So 60 to 70 to 25, that's about 95% of the water that we're actually physically going to be able to recover is coming either from the proximal convoluted tubule or the loop of Henry. Because this is dependent upon concentration gradients, and water is always going to move from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, then this is still obligatory water movement because we have concentration gradients and others. And then in the thick ascending limb of Henley, uh, do we continue to move water? No, water becomes impermeable. And then we can use energy to help us reabsorb 
things like chloride and electrolytes. Okay. Now, as we get to the distal convoluted tube, because we have specialized cells called principal cells, and principal cells activity is controlled by hormones, it's no longer obligatory water. If it's hormone regulated, then it becomes faculty reabsorption of water. And we can do up to 5% more water under the hormone ADH, which is produced by what? Organ? Hypothalamus in your brain. So, do you ever wonder why the brain would want to control kidney function? Because if you overexpand blood vessels in your brain, they rupture and you have strokes. And hemoglobin is highly toxic to neurons. So when you get a blade in the brain, you get a bunch of neurons that die from hemoglobin. Okay. So we don't want bleeds in our brain because it impacts neurons. So that's why we see the connection between, that's now becoming more and more discussed in the media, between head trauma and concussions, where you get these minor bleed events in the brain and long-term loss of brain function. Yes. In fact, the, one of the more recent studies shows that one concussive event can, ex can increase your chances of dementia by 25% later in life. Because of that. All right. So what the brain then wants to do is say, hey, hey don't overstress my blood vessels. So it releases ADH, which targets principal cells. And what does it cause the principal cells to incorporate into the membrane? Protein that helps move water. Aquaporin, yes. All right. So the other thing that we can do is we can we can change the rate at which these uh, these active transport mechanisms are acting with another hormone called aldosterone. Where's aldosterone produced? In the adrenal gland. And then what's the beauty of the anatomy? Where's the adrenal gland set? Where do we find an adrenal gland? Sitting on top of the kidney. So the blood flow pattern is pretty direct there in terms of where our adrenal gland is located. Right? So then we have other cells, which are specialized cells in our distal convoluted tubule collecting deck. They're called intercalated cells. And intercalated cells are the cells that play a game with hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. And so what intercalated cells can do is they can vary the amount of bicarbonate you're reabsorbing and the amount of hydrogen ions that you're secreting. So inter intercalated cells are a final adjustment to maintaining blood pH. If, you're, if your blood is too acidic, then you'd want to secrete hydrogen ions and, and retain bicarbonate ions. If your blood is way too basic, then you'd want to secrete bicarbonate ions and retain hydrogen ions. So if your blood is real basic, your urine is going to be more basic. And if your blood is real acidic, your urine is more acidic, which is why we look at urine pH in a clinical environment, because it indirectly tells us what somebody's state of blood uh, pH is. And what we're going to discover uh, as we continue our conversation next week uh, on Monday is that uh, our blood pH doesn't like to change very much at all, or we get into significant trouble right away. So the kidney's role is real critical in that. Right? And then uh, 
And then we also can adjust the amount of calcium that we're losing over here. Uh, and, and the parathyroid gland releases a hormone called PTH, parathyroid hormone. And if you get an increase in PTH, it's usually due to the fact that you have low blood calcium. So if you have low blood calcium, would you want to secrete calcium to the urine or recover calcium from the urine? You want to recover calcium from the urine to help bring blood calcium levels back. And you want to maintain blood calcium because neuron-neuron interaction requires calcium to release neurotransmitters. The cardiac muscle requires calcium, skeletal muscle requires calcium for contraction. Okay. As we get into the clefting duct, then we can see the same pattern. We have principal cells again that cause facultative water reabsorption via ADH. Yeah, they respond to, to aldosterone and help us with sodium and chloride uh, homeostasis. And there are interplated cells again in the, in the collecting depth. And the interplated cells are going to help us maintain blood pH. And we can secrete potassium and hydrogen ions. And we secrete hydrogen ions if our blood is more acidic or more acidic. This is a summary of all that. I have one little chart for you. If you can't read it, go to computer and figure it out. Sorry, I'll put it out. Isn't it kidding? No. I guess what we do in the lab tomorrow is we're going to do the respiratory system. So tomorrow's lab is the anatomy of the respiratory system, looking at it from a histologic standpoint. And then next Tuesday's lab is actually. Uh, a lab where we're going to measure some volume flow of air in you and talk about the, the, the volumes that we can exchange and maintaining healthy levels of oxygen here. Okay. So when we look at the respiratory system, uh, we can think about three processes that are critically important. And then Inherently with it, which I always try to debate whether I should teach uh, cardiac physiology first and then come back and do kidney and, uh, and respiratory because obviously the blood flow to the organs is critically important. But then I have to teach a lot of hormones that we just went over without the, the basis for it. So that's why I do kidney first. So then when we get into cardiovascular, and we're, when we're doing, we're talking about regulation of blood volume, we've already had the kidney, so we actually, it's a review for us instead of like learning the kidney when we're really not studying the kidney. So that's why I do it this way. All right. So we have two things that we want to do. We want to bring air in to our organs where we can exchange. Okay. So bringing air in to our body so we can exchange is pulmonary ventilation. And people who are experts at helping people with pulmonary ventilation are respiratory therapists that work through just the process of pulmonary ventilation. And then if it's actually a, a lung problem where it's not simply moving air in and out, but it's exchange in the lung, then we go to a pulmonologist who is an expert at the lungs. So what we do is we move air in and out via pulmonary ventilation. Then inside of our lungs, we create these amazing little uh, air sacs that are going to be lined with simple squamous epithelium. And so this would be the lumen. And then right next to it, we have a little tiny capillary there, so we have a blood vessel. So with pulmonary ventilation, we try to increase the amount of oxygen in this space, because that facilitates the diffusion of oxygen into our blood. So we want to move oxygen into our blood. 
But we're also carrying a waste product from mitochondria in our blood. So our waste product from mitochondria would be carbon dioxide. And we want to get rid of carbon dioxide. So in that effect, while we're breathing, while we're doing this, the oxygen level in our lungs is dropping. And the carbon dioxide level is elevated because we're moving the oxygen into our blood. So we have to constantly pulmonarily ventilate to constantly bring the fresh air in that has higher amounts of oxygen and it helps us expel our carbon dioxide so we can drop carbon dioxide levels. And then we do the exchange and then we have to breathe out again. So this process of adding oxygen to our blood and removing carbon dioxide from our blood is external respiration. And then what we depend upon is our heart to create a pattern that pumps the blood from our lungs. So what we're going to find out on our two-chambered heart is the right side of the heart is designed to, to pump deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So the right side of our heart is pumping deoxygenated blood to our lungs. Our left side of the heart is collecting onto rich blood from lungs. side is actually, and I could say, the right side is also collecting deoxygenated blood from the body to pump it to the lungs. Okay. So the right side of our collects deoxygenated blood, pumps it to our lungs. Our left side of our collects oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it to our body. Okay. So as, the, as it's going up from the left side of the heart, then it enters capillary veins. So there's another capillary in our tissues, like our brain and other things. And then our cells have mitochondria. And so what we want to do is we want to transfer the oxygen from our blood to our mitochondria. And since the mitochondria are building up a waste product of carbon dioxide, we want to transfer the carbon dioxide to our blood. So we're going to decrease the oxygen concentration in the blood and increase the carbon dioxide concentration in the blood, better tissues. And this is called internal respiration. So what we're going to do tomorrow in the lab is just look at all the structures involved in pulmonary ventilation. We're going to look at the organization of lung tissue under a microscope so that we can understand external respiration. And then you just have to understand that internal respiration is the opposite of external respiration. So in internal respiration, we're going to do what? Increase what gas in our blood? Oxygen. And decrease what gas in our blood? CO2. In external respiration, we're going to do what? We're going to decrease the relative amount of oxygen in our blood because we're going to transfer it to our cells. And we're going to increase the relative amount of CO2. So those two are opposite events. So tomorrow I'll bring this because we'll go through all the